welcome back everyone to our workshop session number two. This is entitled Presidential Debates, Risky Business on the Campaign Trail. Alan Schroeder is a professor in the School of Journalism at Northeastern University in Boston, where he teaches primarily in the area of visual journalism. He is the author of several books, including Presidential Debates, 50 Years of High Risk TV, Celebrity in Chief, How Show Business Took Over the White House, and a textbook, Writing and Producing Television News from Newsroom to Air. A frequent press commentator, Professor Schroeder has been quoted as an expert source by The Economist, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Los Angeles Times, and USA Today. His TV and radio interviews include ABC, the BBC, CBS, CNN, C-SPAN, MSNBC, Sky News in Canada, the Australian Broadcasting Company, and numerous programs on national public radio, including Fresh Air and All Things Considered. Please welcome Professor Alan Schroeder. Okay. Thank you, Gary. And uh, I'm told as long as I stay in the center here, we should not get that annoying feedback. So uh, if you see me wandering, throw something at me, and I'll come back in the, into the middle here. Uh, well, first of all, thank you uh, to, to Gary and to Sherry and, uh, and, and everyone who has brought us here. I think this is such a great event. And as uh, was mentioned by, by Dan, we're all learning a great deal. Uh, in addition to being interested in debates, uh, I did write a book about the relationship between show business and the presidency. And so coming here to Marion, Ohio, there uh, is a particularly important moment in the evolution of that relationship, uh, which is that, uh, that Warren, Warren Harding had a troupe of Broadway stars come here on a train to uh, visit him at the front porch on Mount Vernon uh, Street. And it's one of the first, if not the first, example of, of uh, show business figures, entertainers actively campaigning for a particular president, and of course that has just flourished in the years since that moment. Uh, but it's, it was interesting, I went over to the house today and did the tour. It, it, it's so interesting to kind of see that and get the geography involved in that. And of course the, the, the story goes, the troupe of actors, the entertainers that came here was led by Al Jolson and they made a, a stop at the Marion Club on the way over to the house and you know they were show business folk to begin with so by the time they got there uh, I guess everybody was uh, had, had had a few and it was quite a boisterous and interesting uh, occasion and, and Dr. Harding here whom I met last night uh, told me that uh, ironically and strangely enough all these years later that in Cincinnati he worked with another doctor by the name of Dr. Jolson who was the grand nephew of uh, Al Jolson so it, it's it's weird, isn't it, how some of this history resonates in, in ways that one would never have thought. Uh, but our topic here today is uh, this idea of, of debates. And I, I particularly liked the uh, opportunity to speak on this uh, theme through the prism of the theme of this symposium, which is reality versus illusion. Um, when we think about presidential campaigns, presidential campaigns are a constructed illusion or a constructed reality based on illusion. Who's constructing it? Well, obviously the campaigns themselves are, but also the media. And so it becomes this kind of weird interaction where you've got the campaigns trying to control the situation and the media trying to write their version of the story. And it becomes this uh, unusual collaboration, this work in progress in which there's often a lot of tension in the development of those ideas. But there is a lot of illusion involved. And so when we think about debates, particularly, and, and what debates do that's different from everything else during the campaign, I think one of the big values that they have is that it is a moment during a presidential campaign in which reality intrudes upon the illusion. Because we are so accustomed to seeing candidates in contexts that they control, in which that control is exerted with a heavy hand so that we see this constructive version of who the candidates are. Well, you put them in a live debate for 90 minutes. The very nature of a live debate is that it is live, unscripted television. And so, at least for the duration of that debate, they've got to give up that sense of control and that sense of illusion, and they're forced into this other reality, one that leaves them vulnerable. 
And yet, having said that, debates themselves are also a constructive reality because it's sort of not a normal thing to do if you think about it. And there are a lot of instances in debates in which artifice has come into play. And of course, there's the whole question of how candidates prepare for debates and how they go in with memorized zingers and things that they're supposed to do during the debate. And yet, they don't always get the opportunity to do that. And of course, the other difference is they're up there on the stage with their opponents. So you can go in with the best game plan in the world. You can go in as prepared as you can possibly be. But ultimately, you know, you're sort of diving off of the, the high board into the water and you're not sure what is, is going to happen. So I like this theme of, of, of illusion versus reality because I think in debates we have elements of both but uh, in a way that becomes uh, pretty interesting. And it seems to me that the best debaters, the candidates who really know how to do this, are the ones who sort of figure out how to wedge those performing techniques into that particular milieu, into that particular environment, and uh, take advantage of it. And uh, it does not come naturally to a lot of politicians. Even politicians who are very practiced and are very comfortable in the public eye. So I'm going to start with a little bit of history, and that's why I put the freeze frame up on the screen that I have. And, and during the presentation, my idea is to share a few clips along the way. We'll hope you know all the technology works and everything uh, that, that make a few particular points here about the value of debates. I think, and um, and and why politicians, frankly, are afraid of. Uh, in, in most cases, occasionally you'll get somebody who isn't. So 1960 is the first year, the first presidential cycle in which presidential debates occur. There were four that year. There are some differences with the 1960 debates versus the later ones. For instance, uh, as you can see from the, the setup here, the, uh, those are the only general election debates that ever took place in television studios. All the rest of them have been held in uh, theaters or auditoriums, usually on college campuses. Um, you had a different format. Uh, you had a panel of journalists asking questions. You did not have a single moderator, although here we're looking at Howard K. Smith of uh, ABC News in the middle uh, of that shot. Uh, the debates lasted only an hour. Today, they last an hour and a half. And in 1960, there was no vice presidential debate. They talked a little bit about maybe trotting out the VP candidates for 15 minutes at the end of one of these, but ultimately decided that it was not worth doing. Um, the lessons from those four debates, and particularly from that first debate in Chicago, September 26, 1960, and, and incidentally, the first debate this year will also take place on September 26th, uh, the lessons are many, and uh, of course probably some of the most famous ones are the questions of the visuals, that because Nixon did not look well and was heavily perspiring, he was thought to have lost the debate. Something was really off about him that night. You can kind of see it in the body language here, and there's actually a little bit of explanation for it. He had just been out of the hospital for a very short period of time. He had had uh, a knee infection that had hospitalized him for a couple of weeks. He gets out of the limousine as it pulls into WBBM Studios in Chicago, bangs the bad knee on the car door, went white, blood drained from his face, he kind of cringed, and you can see right there in that freeze frame that he was extraordinarily uncomfortable. And the Kennedy people, of course, knew that he had been hospitalized, and so one of the things that they negotiated was that the candidates had to stand for the debate because they wanted Nixon to be in a bad uh, position. There's a, a latter-day parallel to that as well, which was in the... Uh, in the 2004 vice presidential debate, Dick Cheney had had a heart attack, and so the negotiators for John Edwards, the, the first thing they wanted was, well, we gotta have him stand up and walk onto the stage and all of this, and the, uh, the negotiators said, uh, no, we don't think we're gonna be able to do that, and of course, that, that debate took place uh, seated. But it's warfare, and uh, you know, any little perceived advantage, one way or the other, is something that the, the candidates and the campaigns will take advantage of. But we learn from these debates, and particularly, as I say, that first debate that caught everybody by surprise, including the press, by the way. I, in, in writing my book and researching my book, I went back and spent a lot of time reviewing the press accounts of the 1960 debates. 
The day of this first debate, September 26, 1960, the Washington Post had nothing on its front page about the debate. The New York Times had a little one paragraph television advisory, uh, the debate will be on tonight at such and such a time. That was it. Nobody got what a big deal this was going to be. And nobody perceived that there would be, in the course of, nine, of, of 60 minutes, a whole new political genre born in one that uh, has had a great deal of power, not just in the United States, but all over the world. There is something, I, I also study debates internationally and travel uh, and lecture a lot in other countries looking at how they do debates, and we're now up to about 80 countries that have incorporated electoral debates, televised debates, into their, uh, their campaigns and their elections. And it all started right there in this uh, television studio in, uh, in Chicago. We learned the riskiness of debates, that even for someone as practiced as, uh, as Richard Nixon, who at that point had been vice president for eight years, and was by far the better known figure, the one thought to have had the better command of television, even for someone uh, of his level and his skill, it was a difficult thing and something that, that ultimately for him was regarded as a, uh, as a failure. We learned that the candidates have to prepare appropriately for debates. Kennedy and his team spent a lot of time prepping for the debates. Kennedy himself actually met with Don Hewitt, Hewitt, later famous for being the producer of 60 Minutes, who was the director of that first debate. Kennedy had a private meeting with him. Hewitt asked Nixon if he wanted to. Nixon couldn't be bothered. Uh, Kennedy's people assembled for him something they called the Nixopedia. I looked at it in the Kennedy Library. It's this big, thick binder of all the positions that Nixon had taken over the years on the issues of the day, and Kennedy would study that so that he was well-versed. Nixon uh, basically just said, I know what I'm doing, trust me, I've been the vice president, I don't need to prepare. And we see what the results of that were. Uh, we learned the importance of the media reaction that those interpretations after the debate that said that Nixon had really you know, lost that conclusively, those hardened as conventional wisdom. And so the candidates and the campaigns began to realize that you're not just courting the voters, you're also courting the press. You're trying to get a positive review out of a debate because those things then congeal into conventional uh, wisdom. I think an underappreciated lesson, because it had never been done before, and you know, it's easy to go back in retrospect and figure out what's what, but at the time, I don't think anybody quite got the power of seeing those two contenders for the presidency side by side on the same stage, because it is the only time we have during campaigns to do that sort of comparison shopping that is um, kind of natural in any situation in which you are making uh, a choice. Um, so it isn't just the individual performances that matter, it's how those performances stack up against each other. And over the years of, uh, throughout the history of presidential debates, there have been a number of instances in which that became uh, of particular relevance. The shadows that Kennedy and Nixon cast linger still. I don't think there's a, a debater, a presidential debater, even now, who does not go into that arena you know, without that awareness that this can really do me some harm, or conversely, it can do me a lot of good. And it all goes back to 1960. The, the power of these debates in 1960 was such that it was another 16 years before they resumed. They resumed in 1976 because in 1964, although Kennedy had committed to debating his opponent in Goldwater, uh, at that point it was apparent he was uh, you know, uh, throwing his hat in the ring, he had also said he would do it. Lyndon Johnson wanted no part of it. He was not a televisual president. Um, then you, and he was far enough ahead that he didn't, he didn't have to give anything on that point. You fast forward to 68 and 72, who's the candidate? Richard Nixon. 
absolutely no way is he walking that walk again. And, uh, and again, he was in enough of a power, of, uh, a power position there to be able to, to dictate those terms. 1976, you had incumbent President Gerald Ford, but a strange incumbent, as you recall, under the circumstances, and who had only been in office in, for a couple of years, against Jimmy Carter, both of them more or less at equal standings in the polls uh, over the summer. So at the Republican convention in 1976 in Kansas City, Gerald Ford makes this dramatic announcement, departs from the script, nobody saw it coming, it was not announced to the press in advance, I'm going to challenge Jimmy Carter to a debate. Jimmy Carter instantly accepted, and in every presidential cycle since then, we've had uh, at least one, usually three, presidential debates and a vice presidential debate, although there was no vice presidential debate in 1980. Um, so it has become now part of our ritual, and it is something that I think is inescapable for the candidates. They like to not have to do it, but I don't think the choice is theirs anymore because it has become an entrenched part of the, uh, of the process. But they don't like having to do it for a lot of reasons. For one thing, it requires a great deal of time and effort. You have to pull off the campaign trail. You go into full-scale rehearsal mode. You lose precious moments just when you ought to be out there connecting with the, with the voters. It's weird and uncomfortable for them to have to do it. I mean, imagine a job interview, which is the analogy I think is the most appropriate for, for debates. That's what they are. They're the job interview. We are the bosses. We the voters. And we're evaluating the candidates. But imagine if during the job interview, you just bring all the candidates in together and sort of sit them down and let them fight it out among themselves. It's a, it's a, not, a not a circumstance I think any of us as applicants would ever wish for. And it's particularly uh, something that, that incumbent presidents really, really, really don't like to do. We don't have that problem this year, but if you remember 2012, Barack Obama's first debate was a disaster. He lost it by the widest margin uh, of any presidential debater to Mitt Romney because Mitt Romney was ultra prepared wanted to be there, couldn't wait to get out there and, and, and make the sale. And then you have President Obama who's thinking, wait a minute, I've already got this job. What do I need to go on this stage and legitimize this upstart for? And his aggravation, his irritation definitely uh, showed through in that, uh, in that circumstance. I think another reason that, that candidates are um, fearful of debates is the stakes. The stakes obviously are enormously high. And this brings us to this question of ratings, television ratings, uh, for presidential debates. The ratings for any year's presidential debates are always the highest of that year, the highest rated programs of that year after the Super Bowl. Only the Super Bowl exceeds the, uh, the debates. And I'm predicting, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and say this year, uh, we'll see. Uh, but I have a feeling that, you know, this one is going to be a remarkably well-watched series of debates. So even for candidates who are, even for a sitting president, even for Barack Obama, these are the largest audiences they ever face. We're talking about 50, 60, 70, 80 million people at a time. And it's intimidating. Walter Mondale, there's a great quote from him where he talked about, uh, he, he described it as the longest walk, that walk from backstage out to the lectern. Scared the hell out of any one of us. Um, even these guys that are used to being out there day after day on the campaign trail interacting with, uh, with, with, with audiences. Part of the uh, intimidation, too, is not just the size of the viewership, but the resonance of the debates in the media. The media cover these things, as you all know, um, as though it were, you know, the second coming or something. I mean, there, there's just so much attention placed on, on the debates, particularly the speculative period leading up to the debates. You know, it's gotten ridiculous. The countdown clocks on the screen, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, I was over in, in uh, the UK in 2010 when they had their very first presidential debates. And I, I was sitting there, uh, I was in my hotel, and I, I was really excited for all of the hoopla in advance. There was no hoopla. 
They just had their regular program, and then at 9 o'clock, on pops the debate, no clocks, and then as soon as it was over, it went back to regular programming, just like it did here in 1960 uh, with Kennedy and, 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 and Nixon. But this idea of the analysis and the, and the, the endless, you know, sort of obsessive level of, uh, of, of looking at, at their body language, facial expressions, clothing, uh, all of that stuff. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly intimidating experience. You're also fighting not just as a candidate for that debate and that win and that election, you're fighting for your legacy. Think about Dan Quayle for a second. What is the thing that everybody in America remembers about Dan Quayle is you're no, you're no JFK. Uh, I, I always say that's going to be chiseled on his tombstone, the poor guy, uh, when the time comes. But this is what you're, you're looking at. And for, for politicians, particularly those who have a future, uh, they are thinking very closely about what do I get out of this down the line. Uh, because we know that debates can halt uh, a, a candidacy or certainly halt momentum. Uh, Marco Rubio this year in New Hampshire, the famous debate where he kept giving the same program response to the question that was being asked him to the point where Chris Christie, you know, sort of made fun of him. That was the beginning of the end for that candidacy, and he certainly is not the only um, example of that. Um, now, I should distinguish, and, and mentioning Marco Rubio, I guess, gives me a good opportunity to do that. I should distinguish between general election debates and primary debates, because there was quite a bit of difference. For instance, in the primary debates uh, this cycle and over the past few cycles, they're sponsored by the cable news networks, so they're very glitzy productions with commercials, and music, and the national anthem, and all this stuff and multitudes of people asking questions because the networks want to feature their high-paid talent, as opposed to the general election debates, which are produced by the Commission on Presidential Debates, all of them since, uh, since 1988 have been. They have no commercial interruptions. It's a very bland set. It's a very formal format. Um, a lot of people complain about the general election debates. Oh, they're so boring. But the alternative to that is that you turn it into kind of a game show, and I think in some of these uh, some of these primary debates, especially the past couple of cycles, we've seen instances in which that has uh, has happened. Um, and, and then just as we're thinking about the stakes here with the vice presidential debates, it's a whole different set of stakes. It's a it's a set of stakes about your future because most vice presidential candidates tend to want to run for higher office later on. But it's also the lower stakes than the presidential uh, level elections, which makes vice presidential uh, debates awfully fun to watch. I generally like those better than the presidentials, because the presidential candidates get very, uh, you know, sort of uh, rigid and, 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 and not that, that willing to scrap. Now, all bets are off this year, uh, as we've been saying all afternoon here, and we'll see how that, how that goes. Um, the thing that got me interested in presidential debates is that before I entered academia, I worked as a television producer for 10 years. And I always produced live TV. And you quickly learn, as a live TV producer, that things can and will go horribly wrong. Um, I had a guest one time on a show that I produced. He, he, this didn't happen on the air. It happened five minutes before we went on the air. Guy has a heart attack in the dressing room and dies on it. And um, so, you know, you're, as a producer, nobody at home is going to know that or needs to know that. You're just thinking, how the hell am I going to fill those five minutes? Um, I, I had one time uh, a riot break out. We had a live studio audience, and it was a controversial topic, and people started taking swings at each other, and we had to call the Boston Police Department in to, uh, to settle the thing. So it got me thinking about the danger of live television. And it is incredibly dangerous, particularly for candidates who are so accustomed to a high, if not total, level of control over everything that they do on the campaign trail. So let's look at a couple of moments here in which uh, danger lurked for uh, particular uh, candidates. And you know, the danger can come um, in uh, a number of, of different ways. Uh, hang on a second of the thing here. Uh, so this is the famous question of Michael Dukakis at the beginning of the first, or the last rather, 
Uh oh, well, that's not going to work. Okay, well, sorry about that. You'll remember that Bernie uh, Shaw from CNN asked Michael Dukakis if your wife were raped and murdered, would you change your opposition to the, uh, the death penalty? And Michael Dukakis, who, by the way, uh, is a professor at my university in Northeastern, I rode the subway with him the other day after, <laughs> after class, just kind of randomly, we had this long conversation, and I'm thinking, this guy could have been president, and now he's got the same job that I do, something's wrong there. <laughs> um, but Dukakis gave this very unfeeling response. He was not feeling very well in general that night. He, he was coming off the flu, and, you know, things were not... We're not good for him, uh, and, and yet by not reacting in a sufficiently human way, shall we say, uh, it, it caused him to lose the debate right at the beginning of the debate. That's all anybody ever remember about that debate was that he said that goofy uh, thing about, uh, no, it wouldn't bother me, and just kept on going. Um, and you actually had a kind of interesting, you know, I talk about how, how important the contrast between debaters is. You actually had a, an interesting moment right after that that nobody remembers, which is that Bernard Shaw then asked George H.W. Bush, um, he said something like, if you, the, the question begins with, with, if you die in office, and then the question goes on about would Dan Quayle be qualified to take over. But at the moment he says, if you died in office, George H.W. Bush goes, like that, and it's kind of this, it, it's, it's somebody having a normal human reaction versus, uh, I've done this a million times and I'm just going to say the same thing that I always say, kind of thing, and, and that's the sort of detail, I think, that debates offer us as viewers that you don't get under other circumstances. And, and those, are, those are insights that have uh, some value. So, so some of the danger, the danger comes from a lot of different places. The danger in being in a live debate can come from, uh, for instance, the, uh, the, 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 the questions that are asked. It can come from something that the opponent says about you. It can come from the visual aspect of the debates, Nixon sweating. Uh, let me see, I'm not sure, I, I, I'm, I'm not optimistic now that, that I got this error message. And you know, the thing is, you, you go in and you, ah, here it is, after all my apologies. You, you go in and check this stuff, you know, in advance, and then it never works when you want it to. But here's a good example of um, a moment in a debate in which um, things go south, in this case for uh, Apple. Load, 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 load. All right, let's see if we've got some sound. The Naval Norwood bill, which is the main one pending. Now watch what Gore does, and watch how Bush reacts. How do you see the differences between the two of you, and we need to move on? Well, the difference is, is that I can get it done. That I can get something positive done on behalf of the people. That's what the question in this campaign is about. It's a very small moment. Uh, in fact, let me see if I can just give it get it back and, and play it for you one more time. Um, this motion uh, here... Between the two of you, and we need to move on. Well, the difference is, is that I can get it done. That I can get something positive done on behalf of the people. That's what the question in this campaign is about. Now, it's not like what's your philosophy and what's your position on okay. issues. But can you get things done? Okay, and on it goes. Um, the point here is, you all laughed. The people in the audience, it was a town hall format where you have the citizens as the ones asking the questions. They all laughed. George Bush didn't have to say anything, just that. And But here's an example of um, one of those little visual cues that speaks louder than the thing itself. And that, that people watching at home are going to have a different reaction to than, uh, than they would if it were a standard political speech or a rally or any of the other mechanisms through which candidates talk to us. Um, Gore had, had, had told his advisors that he wanted to try that. Oh, what if I do this thing where I just like move in on him? Uh, and they said, don't do it. This, that, that never works. Um, he did it anyway. You may remember another 
sort of similar example with Hillary Clinton where Rick Lazio, her senator opponent in New York State, walks up to her with this piece of paper, this pledge that he wants her to sign, and he walks over to her podium and waves it in her face and sort of demands that she sign it on the spot, and she wasn't having any of it. Who would? Uh, and it was read as this, this kind of failure on his part to appreciate the interpersonal dynamic and an example of a man kind of invading a woman's space and, and, and being, you know, sort of inappropriately aggressive to her and all of that kind of thing. So some of this is just, you know, the camera picks up on these little performance aspects and, 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 and reveals things or, or at least moments about candidates that they may not necessarily wish for us to know reality intruding, again, upon the, uh, the illusion. Uh, one of the interesting things for me as a debate observer is always to watch how each candidate treats the other. I think you can sort of learn a lot. And, it, it, you know, this cycle with the primary debates with Trump, how he has treated the other opponents has become, you know, sort of part of the running theme here. But let me show you a famous moment from a, uh, a, a, a primary debate. You've all seen it, but it's, it's always kind of fun to watch this again, I think. Now watch not only Obama, but watch Hillary's reaction, and also watch the audience coming. My question is in the audience. This. What can you say to the voters of New Hampshire on this stage tonight, who see your resume and like it, but are hesitating on the likability issue, where they seem to like Barack Obama more? Well, that hurts my feelings. <laughs> I'm sorry, Senator. I'm sorry. But I'll try to go on. <laughs> He's very likable. I, I, I agree with that. I don't think I'm that bad. Um, uh, you're likable you know, enough. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. All right. Um, that is thought to be one of Barack Obama's uh, worst <laughs> moments on the public stage. Um, now, you know, I don't want to suggest that we should over-conclude from these little moments, but the, but the reality is that we don't get very many of those because the candidates and the campaigns spend so much energy and effort to insulate the candidates from any of those little intrusions of reality. I think, you know, I look at that clip and I, I say as badly as Obama played it, and he thought he was being nice, by the way, but it doesn't read that way. I think as badly as he played it, Hillary played it really well. I mean, you look at the expression on her face, she gets the moment, she takes advantage of it, she kind of makes a little bit of a joke. And she had a little assist there from the producers in that cutaway of, of Chelsea. You see Chelsea sitting out there with a smile on her face, and it kind of helps, you know, a little backup. Let's send in uh, some reinforcements here for, for, for Hillary. That's another difference, by the way, between the, uh, the general election debates and the primary debates. That obviously was a primary debate, Obama versus Clinton. But in the general election debates, they are, they're prohibited from taking shots of the audience. And in fact, go back to my previous example of Dukakis and Kitty, the question about Kitty Dukakis, if Kitty Dukakis were raped or murdered. Well, Kitty Dukakis is right there on the front row. They could have taken a shot of her, and it might have helped, you know, humanize her a little bit, or if her expression had been a little more, you know, what we would expect, it could have helped her husband, but they did not have that uh, capability because the negotiated rules prevented those kinds of, uh, those kinds of cutaways. Um, one more example here of the dangerous moment, and another quite famous one, and this one goes by uh, so fast that you really, uh-oh, all right, well, I'm, I'm, my batting average is not too, too good here. All right. Uh -huh. I don't know what's going on here. You know? I mean, uh, there, I've got a, a different version of it here if this one will work. No, no one does either. Okay, well, here's what happens. Is, this is the very first town hall debate in the history of presidential debates. In 1992, it was a big... A uh, revolutionary year for presidential debates because it's the first time that the formats changed. And so one of the new formats was the idea of a group of citizens posing questions to the candidates. It was in Richmond, Virginia, and you have uh, a young woman who stands up and asks President Bush, sitting President Bush, um, 
it was a confusingly worded question. How does the national uh, uh, debt affect you personally? What she really meant was the economy. But he didn't hear the big question. He heard the literal question. So um, he doesn't answer first. Ross Perot answers first. And while Ross Perot is answering, this is what George H. W. Bush does, and it lasts a millisecond like that. He wanted out of there. It was so obvious to everybody watching. And years later, when he was interviewed about it by Jim Lehrer, who goes back and interviews all the candidates after the fact, he said, absolutely. I was looking at my watch because I could not wait for this thing to be over. But what's the effect of that visually? The effect of that visually, especially with a, an audience of citizens asking questions, is I don't give a damn about your question, and I've got better things to do, and stop wasting my time. And that was one of those things that, you know, it just, it, a split second, and yet it helped cement a narrative that was already in place, as Dan mentioned the thing about the scanner earlier, there was this sense of disconnect between George H.W. and the voters, and he could not have done anything worse, uh, in my opinion, in that moment than, than do that. And by the way, all over the world now, uh, the one lesson every candidate has learned is do not wear a watch to a debate. Don't even tempt yourself with the possibility of, uh, of glancing down at that. So debates are, it, it, here's, here's the thing that, that a lot of candidates don't get about debates, and it always kind of surprises me, is that it is a very specific and different thing. It is a muscle that does not get exercised except when you debate. So they always think, oh, I do speeches every day, and I'm out on the campaign trail, and I'm at rallies, and I'm answering questions from the press. Of course I can debate. But the debate is a very particular thing, and it calls upon a very particular skill set that is largely theatrical. I mean, you have to know your material, obviously, but you also have to know the particular theatrical contours of the debate and the particular theatrical demands of the debate. So, for instance, you, you need to have a very fluent understanding of the format. Uh, you need to know how to work the clock. You know, you, you need to know how to run out your time if you're, if you're stalling or how to take advantage uh, if, you're, if you're not. Um, you need to know the difference between when to go to your prepared remarks and went to improvise. Bill Clinton, who, who I think was one of the great debaters, I think Reagan was a very strong debater, I think Clinton's probably the best that we've had, uh, Kennedy was good, but, but Clinton I think had a great analogy for debating, and uh, of course he's a musician, he said it's like playing jazz, that you have to know the melody, and you have to have that melody line in your head, but you also need to know when it's okay to riff a little bit play that extra little flourish or whatever. Uh, never losing sight of what the notes are. And, and, and I think that's absolutely the essence of it. And yet something that uh, so many candidates, even those at the highest levels, even those most practiced in political performance, uh, often forget. I mentioned briefly about preparation for debates, but this has become a cottage industry. Debate prep is now its own thing. Now, 2016, Donald Trump, again, I don't know what's going to happen, but we know from things that have been written during the primaries that he didn't really prep for those debates. Um, and I think it's fairly apparent in, in, in his performance. Um, and, and, and yet, you know, he was also in a different situation. You're up there on stage with 10 people in, in a 90 minute debate or whatever, you know you're only going to have to really speak for a few minutes. You can, you can sustain that in a way that a one-on-one a, a -on -one debate re would require a great deal more out of you. Um, but, but, you know, different candidates have different attitudes about this. Uh, for instance, the, the, the candidate who prepared the most of any candidate in presidential history was Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney did 16 complete mock debates. So by that I mean real time, 90 minutes, under the lights, suits, ties, mock opponent, mock moderator, um, no turning back. If you make a mistake, you just keep going. Uh, and so by the time he got to that first debate in Denver with Obama, the one that Obama lost so badly, Romney was loaded for bear and he was ready to go and there wasn't much that you were going to be able to do to get him uh, off the path there. Others resent 
having to debate. One of my favorite um, debate news visuals, if you want to call it that, I guess, is Bob Dole in 96, um, up on the, he had a condo in Florida, up on an upper story uh, of a, a high-rise building. He's standing uh, on the balcony of his apartment, throwing his debate prep materials off as the press is recording the video of this. You know, dull being dull, uh, just thinking, I really can't be bothered to uh, indulge in much, uh, in much preparation here. But the good ones do prep. And, and even the ones that you think, you know, they're probably pretty good already, they don't need that much prep, but Bill Clinton was a, a real student of debate prep. And so, for instance, if it was a town hall debate, they would lay out a mock stage, he would know exactly how close he could go to be in camera shots, he would know where to stand so that Bush would be in the camera shot behind him, or Dole. Um, he, I, I've interviewed for, for my book, I went back and interviewed uh, a lot of the, the technical crews, the, the people behind the scenes, the directors and so forth, who actually did the, the camera shooting and the directing on those debates. And uh, one of the things that happens in every debate is the afternoon of the debate, each candidate gets about half an hour on the set alone with his team of advisors and the technical crew. And he said Clinton would come in and just pepper him with questions. If I stand here, what happens? Can I move over there? Where's the camera? Da, 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 da. And meanwhile, you know, others would come in, Bob Dole, walk around, 30 seconds, it's fine, we'll see in a couple of hours. So there's this, there's this thing that they have to do if they're going to really be good at it, which I think is, is to take it seriously, uh, prepare accordingly, and, uh, and, 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 and really understand that this is not like other things we're doing during the campaign. We've got to really think about this as its own specific, uh, specific animal. Um, one reason that, that you know, reality intrudes here uh, is that debates can change the storyline. Let me show you again. This is a very famous clip. Uh, you've seen it a million times, and let's hope you're going to see it one more. Yeah. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Hold on. Nope, you're not going to see it again. It's, it's the moment where uh, Reagan, after, in 1984 against Walter Mondale, there were only two presidential debates that year. The first one had been a disaster for Reagan. He was kind of meandering, he just didn't seem sharp. You know, in retrospect, you look at it now, and knowing his illness, you, you, you almost have to wonder if, if there was some evidence of that at that point. Uh, but in the second debate, he knew he had that problem, because all the coverage after the first debate was, is Reagan too old? Is he out of it? Has his moment passed? And, uh, and, and so he comes back with that famous joke about, uh, he was asked a question about what would you do under such and such a circumstance, and he said, well, first of all, I want everybody to know that I'm not going to exploit the youth and inexperience of my opponent. You <laughs> see Mondale with this big smile on his face. I mean, it was a funny moment. Everybody in the audience laughed. Mondale laughed. And it was, it was such that it turned that storyline around. It just, it just wiped away all of those endless nights of coverage of, you know, interviews with his doctors and clips that showed him in moments where he didn't seem to be as, as sharp as, uh, as, as he had been, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, before we get to, to, to some questions here, because I do want to, you know, these are, these are uh, things that everybody knows, because everybody watches the debate, so I'm sure you have opinions and, and, and things that you want to, you know, points you want to make, so I want to get to that. But, but I want to make the point that I think the other thing that really distinguishes debates from all the other things that happen on the campaign trail, and this is not just my opinion, there's been extensive research to back this up, that voters have a real buy-in to debates. Voters feel like this belongs to me. And it's kind of back to that job interview uh, analogy. That, you know, the press has their opportunities to ask questions in press conference. The press is out there traveling with the campaigns all the time. The, the candidates are kind of always at a remove from the voters in some way. And so you get this moment where it really comes down to a dialogue between the applicants for the job and those who are going to decide who gets the job. And people take that very seriously. When you look at these ratings, you know that to assemble an audience of 60 or 70 million Americans in 2016, you're, you're going well beyond the political junkies. It's not people like you guys that care about this stuff. It's everybody that tunes into these things. You don't watch a debate, 
you got nothing to talk about at work the next day because everybody else did. And, uh, and, and I think it, it, it just gives this kind of uh, sense of civic participation in a way that we've lost and that there really isn't anything else analogous to in our, uh, in our modern era. And I would also make the point, and as I've been researching these for 20 years now, and this is, is kind of the direction that they're headed, that social media now involves people even more so. Because it used to be the pundits, the journalists, the media were the ones that got to make the pronouncements and decide somebody wins, somebody loses, somebody that was a great one, that was a bad one. All of that stuff is happening in real time. It's happening not just on the part of journalists, it's happening on the part of voters and the public. And thus reinforces, I think, that direct connection that people have to the, to the phenomenon of debates. Debates as political vehicles are changing a little bit in the sense that, you know, it used to always be trying to persuade that 10, 15% of the electorate who had not decided and the debate is the place to make the, make the close the deal, make the sale. But now that, you know, as we saw in the previous presentation, the, 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 the camps have kind of hardened and there's not too much possibility for crossing over. Debates are now about motivating your supporters, making sure they get out there to vote, making sure that they talk you up, that they post things, nice things about you and nice links on Facebook, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, just in conclusion, and then we'll, we'll talk here, back to this theme of reality versus illusion. Um, Daniel Gorston, the famous American historian who wrote the book in 1962 called The Image, coined the term pseudo events and he used debates as the classic example of a pseudo-event. And it is because, as I say, it's a form of constructed reality. But within that pseudo, I think there's an awful lot of real stuff going on. And it's a little bit like what the lawyers call demeanor evidence. That if you're sitting there on the jury, you're kind of looking, you're reading these signals that go beyond just what they're saying. You're looking at how they're saying it. And a debate gives us the opportunity not only to do that, but to do that on the comparison basis that, is, that, 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 makes, uh, that makes debates um, so, so unique. Um, so I would say that in spite of their artifice, that debates remain one of the most valuable vehicles that we have as voters to assess and evaluate the candidates. And I would also make the point, and I'll close with this, that, uh, that because debaters the debaters themselves, the politicians, are, are fearful of the experience because they don't like having to do it, that for the voters, that's a good thing, right? Anything that puts them in a slightly uncomfortable position and gets them off their script, off of their high level of control, that's helpful to the rest of us in making our evaluations. So, so let's talk. Well, I, I apologize for the clips. I did mean to show a few more uh, things here, but by all means, let's, uh, let's use the time to chat, okay? I, I would like to know what you thought of the way they did the debates, the Republican debates this year, and the way they did the Democratic debates this year. Because they were not all being there. Right. Yeah, that was a really interesting, we've never had that come up before. The field has never been that large. Uh, as I said, I used to be a, a television producer, and I, one of the things I produced was talk shows, and I just, I really sympathized as a TV producer with this problem. It's a logistical problem. You can't put 17 people on the stage. It just isn't going to work. Uh, you can't get the camera shots, for one thing. You don't, you don't have that many cameras to be able to anticipate who's going to jump in next. Uh, so I thought that the, the division of the two groups, the undercard and the, and the main event, to use the boxing analogy that the media always like, I, I thought that that was a, a practical, albeit not perfect, solution to a, 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 a problem that, um, that there was no way around. And it, I mean, it did give the, no doubt that the people relegated to the kids table, that was the other analogy that kept being used. Um, were at a disadvantage, but you did have one instance, Carly Fiorina, in which her performance in one of those debates was strong enough that her poll numbers went up, thus elevating her into the higher ranks. But of course the problem is too that it puts the onus on, on, uh, on polls, and polls are an imperfect mechanism in many, many ways. So 
you know, name recognition, uh, Donald Trump, just by sheer name recognition, is going to have higher poll standings than, in some cases, a, a U.S. senator, because that senator is known in his or her home state, but not elsewhere. So, I don't know. What did you think of the dividing them into the two camps? Well, I didn't really get to hear the little kid table. Yeah. You know, I, I sort of would like to have heard them, too. Right, right. Yeah, it was a lot of work, and they would do them, you know, normally back to back. And, and even I, who, you know, sort of make a living doing this, there were days when I, by the end of the, the two debates, you're just like, oh man, I don't want to watch any more of this. Um, some of, the, yeah, some of the, the earlier debates, though, were pretty interesting, though. I mean, some of these guys, they knew there weren't as many people watching, so they were a little looser. They didn't have to worry about Donald Trump, because he was always on the big stage, so they didn't have to, you know, cower behind the lectern, fearful that somebody was going to snap their head off. Uh, and uh, so it produced some, some kind of interesting, uh, interesting results. Uh, okay, sir. Yeah, Tom, I have a uh, question. My recollection of the books I've read, the questions I've drawn, the things in the first debate, the first debate, the polls don't agree on the things that they want to do. Yeah. It was the TV. Yeah. The children, yeah. The great backdrop, the great development. Absolutely. The question is, in 1964, it was contemplated by Kennedy and Goldwater that they would have a Lincoln-Douglas type debate. Well, of course, but yeah. that was the end of that. Yeah. But I, it's easy to, uh, I think, to answer my question, but basically, how would you compare and contrast mm -hmm. Lincoln Douglas versus the more modern debates, mm -hmm. and which would be more desirable? Right. Well, of course, Lincoln Douglas. Those were three-hour debates, and uh, they were they were held in front of crowds of, of people who brought picnic lunches and basically spent the day watching the debate. I mean, it was uh, a different era. So, so the, the the television factor is the first thing we have to consider here. Is that by televising something, you're completely altering the the shape of it. Um, the other thing is that the candidates themselves today would be, I think, loath to do a Lincoln-Douglas debate. They like the protection that they think is afforded by other people asking questions. But if you go around the world, in France, for instance, which has been doing debates since the late 60s, they do, essentially, a Lincoln-Douglas. There are moderators sitting there, but they basically just keep the time. And the rest of the time is the candidates you know, kind of going at it. Now, now Lincoln Douglas was a little different in, in, from that because they actually went one at a time. They weren't up there together. Uh, one would talk, then the next one would come up, and then they'd have a rebuttal, and that more like a classic debate. Um, so, uh, personally, I'd love to see it. I can't imagine that any modern candidate or campaign well, I could imagine that perhaps an individual candidate or campaign would want to do it. I can't imagine two of them against each other, both thinking that was a good enough idea that they would ever be able to make it happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, it would certainly be a test of their intellect, wouldn't it? You know? Um, but it would also, you know, here's another thing, and this is, I, I think this will be really interesting this year is that because they're live TV, debates are very vulnerable to um, the element of surprise. And so if it were a Lincoln Douglas debate where there weren't a lot of rules and there wasn't a moderator, one of the, you know, whichever candidate was behind could start throwing bombs and doing crazy stuff. And this may happen with Trump, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, he's such an unorthodox um, candidate and an unorthodox debater that I think the fact that these are live television programs, they can be easily subverted and become something that nobody was expecting, and that could perhaps you know happen in a, in a bad way. So, uh, but but I, I think primarily the reason we don't have that format is the candidates don't want to do it; they're afraid of it. Yeah. Is it better to for the candidates to answer the question even though they're not as prepared on that question, mm -hmm. as opposed to? acting like it was some other question because their remarks are really great. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, well, there's some things that are, some, some innovations I think that I, I hope will take care of, of that eventually. One thing is uh, Twitter has begun experimenting with, uh, with something called Answer Dodge. So you're sitting at home, you're watching the, the debate, and as the candidate is answering, you either register that they're answering or they're dodging. And then those uh, responses get displayed on the screen and could even, in theory, be communicated to the moderator. So the moderator says, you know what? 
We've had 100,000 people and 90,000 say, you did not answer that question. Answer the question. So you, you, could, you could use that reaction, you know, to kind of put people on the spot. Um, so, that, so there's that. The, another thing that has been done is C-SPAN always does this, and, and I'm a big believer in watching these debates on C-SPAN, by the way, because of the talking heads kind of drive you crazy after a certain point. But So C-SPAN, for instance, once the question has been asked, they will put it up on the screen as text and leave it up there throughout the response so that you're be reminded as the viewer, this was the original question, and if they choose to meander beyond it, then that becomes that much more evident. But I do think, you know, I think the technology, if we can figure out a way to integrate it without it becoming too much of, like I say, either a game show or Pokemon Go or something, you know, I, I, I think we can, we, can, we can tap that, the wisdom of the crowd, to uh, call their bluff on things, because you're right, they, there's, a, there's a horrible pattern of people um, lapsing, lapsing into, into their, their, their talking points. There's even, even in, in political uh, circles, they, they, they even have a, you know, some terminology for it, the clubhouse turn. The clubhouse turn is, you, oh, well, let me say this, and then you make your turn onto the thing that you were going to do originally. So, but people are, another thing that's happening is as we watch more debates, as more cycles go along, we, the viewers, are becoming more sophisticated about it. So I think we're recognizing those dodges to a higher degree than, than they were, you know, back in 10 days. Okay. In the Republican primary debates, it seems like moderators had great difficulty maintaining any kind of control mm -hmm. over candidates jumped in, don't mm -hmm. pay attention to finalists. I kept wondering why they didn't just take control technologically by right. turning off the microphone and only turning on the microphone for the person they were asking the question for. Well, yeah, and this is part of the problem when news organizations sponsor debates because there you have the two conflicting goals of news organizations not taking a stand or favoring one candidate over the other. The second you cut off somebody's microphone, Oh, CNN hates Donald Trump because they call it, you know, there's no way to really police that uh, without creating more of a, of a backlash. The first recommendation I would make is get rid of the live audience. That's a huge part of the problem because the candidates pander, the audience goes crazy, they're booing, and, 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 and so all of that is wasted time because what really matters is, you know, the audience are home, the, the millions, not the hundreds. Uh, in the physical space. So, so I think there are, that's part of the problem. Frankly, the cable news networks, as much as they, they pretend like they don't like losing control, they sort of like it when things get a little bit out of control because it's good TV. And, and so when the, when the fur starts flying, when people start insulting each other, and it, unless there be any doubt about that, think about how many times you heard a, 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 a formulation of a question by a moderator uh, like this. Mr. Trump, Mr. Cruz says that you, what do you say about that? I mean, they, they're, that is just a recipe for attack your opponent. Um, and then, you know, to sort of stand back and say, oh, we're horrified that you just, uh, you know, are spending the time doing that is, is really disingenuous. But moderators, let me say something in defense of moderators, because I, I see this, as I say, I, 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 you know, have gotten to know some of the moderators in other countries that have done this, and everybody has this problem. You, you either maintain such a firm hand that now you're a protagonist, you're in there with the debaters, and people don't like that. Or you're so laissez-faire about it. Jim Lehrer in the first Obama-Romney debate is a good example. And Jim Lehrer has done more presidential debates than anyone in this country. He wasn't just having an off night or, or you know, uh, sleepy or something. He, that was a very deliberate choice on his part. He's always said, it's not about me. I'm just going to kind of throw the topic out there, keep an eye on the time, and let them do what they're going to do. And if Mitt Romney is going to be aggressive, um, that's what he's going to do. But moderators are, are in a real tough position. And, and uh, we were talking about this last night, um, that increasingly so, that part of the, one of the offshoots of the political polarization is that everybody is on guard with the moderator. Um, so that things like uh, 
in 90, uh, in, uh, I'm sorry, in 2012, when Martha Raddatz from ABC News was chosen to moderate the vice presidential debate, somebody went back and found that Barack Obama had attended her second wedding because he was friends with the guy that she had married then. They were no longer married. It had been many, many years earlier. But, uh, you know, foul ball. Uh, Barack Obama went to the wedding. That's the kind of stuff that never used to happen. Nobody used to care. And now everybody cares almost a little bit too much. You know, these are journalists. And for the most part, they, you know, they, they're very careful. They're, they recognize that it's a career in here. If, they, if they're in the tank for in a presidential debate, something where tens of millions of people are, are watching, they're not going to favor one side over the other. But it's always the side that lost that says that it was bad moderating. So, so Jim Lehrer did a terrible job moderating that first debate. And then uh, Candy Crowley was just horrible in that second town hall debate where uh, she corrected uh, uh, Mitt Romney uh, in, you know, in favor of, of President Obama. So this is just the way it's going to go. I, it used to be a real feather in the cap for these Washington journalists to get to moderate a, a debate. And I, I, I think increasingly, it's just a, a pain in the name of blood. So we'll see. And they don't get paid or anything either. It's just a civic duty that they, that they perform. Sir? Are these actually debates, or are you more into uh, political debates than you are into debates? I think that, yeah, the. I, well, on the, at the primary level, yeah, I, 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 I do think that we've lost some of what makes them debates. Um, I actually do think that the general election debates, and I think that the, the, the Commission on Presidential Debates that runs them, I, I think they're very cognizant of this, that they don't want it to become the Jerry Springer show, and that's one reason that, that sometimes people complain that they're too boring. It's like, oh, it's the same set they've had since the 90s, and. And in the, in the, in the, well, yeah, there's a reason for that. They want to keep it about the candidates and the, the words that the candidates are speaking, and they don't want it to become the Jerry Springer show. But, uh, but to some extent, it's also going to depend on the individual personalities. If you have a very pugilistic, shall we say, candidate, then the debates are going to be pugilistic. Um, but they're not debates, certainly, in the classical oratorical sense of, of debates. Uh, no question about that. They're TV shows, and we have to, you know, we have to, we have to bear that in mind. And the, and the campaigns have to bear that in mind, and the audience has to bear that in mind. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, a comment and a question. Uh, I saw a documentary recently about the Dukakis election. Mm -hmm. Very well done about. Uh, you know, he was so far ahead and then, you know, lost it. Mm -hmm. The tank thing was covered. <laughs> yeah. That was a real bad day. Yeah. Uh, and they, sh they showed, like, the Lee Atwater, the war room. They just erupted in applause when Dukakis got in the tank. But this debate question about, you know, they knew Susan Eskridge and the Dukakis team, they knew he was very vulnerable mm -hmm. because of the Lily Horton commercials. Mm -hmm. And they had practiced. They said, they could be asked about this. And apparently, they, they showed the uh, clip, and then afterwards, Dukakis went in the hallway and saw Susan Estrich and said, I'm really sorry. Mm -hmm. I know I messed that up. Mm -hmm. And she looked at him and said, we're all doing our best. <laughs> but they knew they had lost the yeah. whole the whole street match. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, uh, Spin room. We now have the spin doctors after the debates. When did that start, and does it do any good? And is it, you know, like, does it matter who they get to do the spinning? Well, I've got some good news on that front. Is uh, the spin room is on the downswing? Um, it's still a big deal, but what they're what they're finding now is that that. There's less necessity for a spin room because the spin, which used to always happen at the end of the debate, is now happening in real time during the debate on social media. And so you have the idea of post debate spinning has less power than it used to, it's less effective than it used to. So 
uh, it began uh, in, I, I would say, well, actually, you know, spin, and I, I read about this in my debate book, that, that, that the real birth of spin was in one of the 1976 debates. You, you guys may remember this, some of you, that there was a, a moment where the mics went dead, and for 28 minutes, Gerald Ford and, and Jimmy Carter stood there like statues while the network tried to get the audio back. The networks were obviously live with the program. They had nothing to do, so they threw it to one of their reporters out in the hall who happened to interview um, James Banker from the Republican campaign who started talking about how, what a great job Gerald Ford was doing. And then they realized, oh, we better get somebody from the, from the Dems too. And so they went to the Carter, uh, the Carter guy, Jody Powell, and he, oh, Carter's really winning this debate. And, and so the, the, cam the campaigns sort of by accident figured out there's something we could do here. So by the 80s, they really began to institute this, and it, it got so ridiculous, you know, and by the 2000s, 2004, that, you know, that the campaigns would spend big, big money flying in big names uh, into the spin room. The, the spin room, and I've been in a couple of these, uh, was, was just a zoo. You know, you've got a million reporters and a million people. You've got people walking around with placards that announces who's underneath the placard, and then the reporters are all sort of, you know, descending on them. It's a, it's a feeding frenzy. One of the one of the operatives described it as uh, as throwing uh, fish food into an aquarium, and all the fish just come to light. Uh, so the the efficacy of that is lessening, however, and and it's you know it's. It isn't cost effective anymore for for the so they'll bring in a few you know sort of big name spinners but uh, but the real spin has moved from a, a post debate game to an in debate game. Would you conclude uh, that if the media people would stop after a debate or even say stop telling us what they said after and just let the people? Talk? Well, that's happening because people aren't relying on the media interpretations the way that they used to. So people are now able to give their own reaction without, you know, having to defer to the judgment of, of, of media people. The media people are never going to stop doing that. You know, that's just their, it's in their nature, it's what they're paid to do, and, um, and they, 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 they like doing it, and they're in the habit of doing it. But, but I think the difference is that, that the audience, the voters, are paying less attention to those judgments and arriving at judgments of their own that may diverge uh, from, what the, from what the media are, are saying. Uh, the downside with social media is that now the journalists are often following the trends on social media, and so it, it becomes almost a herd mentality in ways that never was possible before. There was a famous example from that first debate in 2012, Obama versus Romney. BuzzFeed, uh, I think it was 42 minutes into the debate, posts on its website a story how Barack Obama lost the debate. The debate wasn't even halfway over yet. But the judgment had already been rendered, and that was very influential, and the, all the press are reading each other's stuff, and so it, it becomes set in stone that that's, that that's the way it is. So I, I, I see some positives and some negatives, but I, I do think that the power of that media judgment is, is not as strong as it is. How do you think Donald Trump will prepare for the presidential debates? Yeah, I think that, you know, the, to me the more interesting question, because I don't think he's going to prepare much. I think the more interesting question is, how do you prepare Hillary Clinton for the debates? I mean, I guess my inclination would be you, you hire somebody to play her mock opponent who is just going to throw the most outrageous things at her out of nowhere possible and see what happens. But I, I think she's a very good debater. I think she's underrated as a debater. I thought she was quite good, actually, in, in these... Uh, this series of, of democratic debates. One thing that I think she does really well is she's a good listener. And part of the, the debate is, it, it's kind of back to that Bill Clinton jazz analogy, it's that you're, you're in the moment, that you're not just in there thinking, okay, they told me to say X, Y, and Z, and now I've got to do this, and I've got to do this. You're, you're listening to it as an organic thing, and you're reacting organically. And I think she's got, she's got a lot of skill. 
in that area. I, I also think it's a better milieu for her than giving speeches because in speeches where she's in a large crowd, she often, become, her voice becomes a, a little shrill and, and, and she, she tends to shriek a bit. Uh, and I'm not being sexist, uh, I know that's a sensitive topic, but I think when you're in a more intimate setting and you're speaking into a microphone and you don't have to think about the people on the back row, you can be more natural in your reaction and you, your manner of speaking. And I, I, I see a lot of evidence of that in her. Um, I also think another thing about her is I think she gets what debates are, that you're, that it is a theatrical moment and that you, you need to kind of approach it uh, as such. She uses humor a lot. I'm thinking of during one of the one of the primary debates where uh, there was a commercial break and, uh, and, and, and she was late coming back to the set and she made a joke about the women's room, that it takes longer for women than it does for men. Uh, Donald Trump famously went on to say that, that that was a disgusting thing for her to have said, but uh, but but you know she she made a joke out of it, uh, and and I think those are the kinds of things that you have to be able to do in a, in a debate is you know seize the moment, understand what the moment is. Uh, she also she's she's very good at, at and not just her, but debaters who are good at this are good at modulating. Uh, you know one of Bernie Sanders huge weaknesses as a debater was everything was like this all the time and and you never you know there were no highs and lows and I always think about Franklin Roosevelt uh, talking about the fireside chats who who said it you know it's a little bit like 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 music you, you, you've got moments in the piece where you play loud and you've got moments where you you play soft and the contrast is what kind of kind of works there so uh, so so how do they prepare Hillary you know, I, I, I think we can expect that she will be very familiar with the things that Trump has said that have been controversial and that we'll hear a lot of that. Um, I think she'll be prepared, she better be prepared, if things get personal and, and Bill Clinton's history uh, with women, for instance, is brought up, I think she better be ready for that. Uh, and I imagine she will be, she's got good people around her. and. Uh, and, and she, she knows how to, you know, she's been, she's been in that debate game in a way that he hasn't. You know, I think with Trump, he sort of thought, oh, it's live TV, I've been on The Apprentice, I know how to do this. And yet, if you watch him in the debates, um, he was not that great. I mean, he was great with the one-liners and throwing the zingers out, but was there ever a moment where, at the end of the debate, you, you, you sort of thought, yeah, he's, you know, he's, he, he's going to be formidable uh, in the fall. I, I, I didn't, I didn't see much evidence of that. Um, so we'll see. I, I doubt that they can get into prep in a normal, you know, kind of boot camp, Mitt Romney-esque way. Just doesn't seem in keeping with his, and he did not do it before the, before the, uh, the, the primary debates. And I would also not be surprised if he either tries to change something about the debates or maybe says he's not going to take part in all of them. Some of this may depend on poll standings. If he needs the debates more, you know, typically the person ahead wants fewer, the person behind wants more. Um, so if he's in a position where he thinks he's doing well against her, he may, or he doesn't like the moderator. That's what happened, you remember, in Iowa. There was a, the Fox News debate that was going to be moderated again by Megyn Kelly. His, his mortal enemy, and uh, and he just didn't, didn't do it. It was a mistake. Uh, he went on to lose Iowa. I'm not saying cause and effect necessarily, but it didn't it didn't help him that uh, he, he didn't take part. So you know there may be some shenanigans of that sort uh, down the line. All bets are off. So, all right, my pleasure. Thank you all.